I'm going to take us from um, 1874 to about 1940. One of the nice things about being the headmaster of Harrow is that you get to know members of Winston Churchill's extended family. Uh, Mary Soames, uh, Winston's only surviving child, comes to the school. I sat next to her at dinner probably about 15 times. And, and uh, Winston Churchill's great-great-grandson won a scholarship to Harrow last year. And I've, uh, I've spent a little bit of time in the Churchill archive, where all his papers reside in Churchill College, Cambridge, despite the fact that most of those who have researched Churchill's life have in fact come from this, uh, this university. And I've been pleased to know Winston Churchill's great uh, Oxford biographer, Martin Gilbert, and several of the staff who worked for Churchill. I was once at a memorial service, a Churchill family memorial sat, so as I asked the elderly gentleman sitting next to me in the pew what connection he had with the family. Oh, he said, I translated for Churchill and Stalin at Yalta. And those of you who are, those of you who are historians, um, it just makes you shudder, doesn't it, really? The man who translated for two of the three great world leaders at the conference, which set the shape of the world after 1945. In his autobiography, My Early Life, Churchill describes his entrance exam to Harrow, which he took in 1888 when he was... 13. I was unable to answer a single question on the Latin paper. I wrote my name at the top of the page. I wrote down the number of the question, one. After much reflection, I put a bracket round it. But thereafter, I couldn't think of anything connected with it that was either relevant or true. Incidentally, there arrived from nowhere in particular a blot and several smudges. I gazed for two whole hours at this sad spectacle and then merciful ushers collected my piece of full scrap with all the others and carried it up to the headmaster's table. It was from these slender indications of scholarship that Dr. Weldon drew the conclusion I was worthy to pass into Harrow. <laughs> it is very much to his credit. It showed he was a man capable of looking beneath the surface of things, not dependent upon paper manifestations. <laughs> Churchill could never understand the reason why one had to learn Latin. One of the first things one learns in Latin, that some of you will know, is um, the evocative case, mensa, which means O table, O table. And quite reasonably, Churchill could never see why one would want to address a table. But unfortunately, <laughs> Latin was the most important subject in late 19th century public schools in England. So this attitude was always going to be a bit of a handicap for him. And a few weeks, uh, uh, after a few weeks of Harrow, his housemaster, the person in charge of his boarding house, wrote to his mother, Dear Lady Randolph Churchill, when a boy first comes to a public school, one always expects a certain amount of helplessness, owing to being left to himself, so much more in regard to the preparation of work, etc. But a week or two is generally enough for a boy to get used to the ways of a place. Winston, I'm sorry to say, has, if anything, got worse as the term has passed. <laughs> Constantly late for school, losing his books and papers and various other things, He's so regular in his irregularity that I really don't know what to do. I've written plainly to you, as I do think it's very serious that he should have acquired such phenomenal slovenliness. At his age, very great improvement is possible if he seriously gives his mind to conquering his tendencies, but I am sure that unless a very determined effort is made, it will grow upon him. He's a remarkable boy in many ways, and it would be a thousand pities if such good abilities were made useless by habitual negligence. <laughs> Winston Churchill wrote a huge number of letters uh, as a schoolboy, most of which survive. For a person who spent much of his life dictating to secretaries, it's amusing to read in one letter to his mother, written when he was 14, Milbank is writing this for me as I am having a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Milbank was then 16, and he went on to win the Victoria Cross, you know, which is the top of, uh, medal that you can get in this country for bravery. Uh, he got the, won the Victoria Cross in the Boer War, and then 15 years later, he was killed in action at Gallipoli. Most of Churchill's letters were requests for money. He wrote to his mother, who'd just been robbed in a casino in Monte Carlo. Darling Mama, I'm terrified by hearing that you've been robbed of your purse. 
C'est dommage, because at the moment I must put in a request for un peu plus d'argent. I am quite well. I'm awfully excited about the fencing, which comes off on Tuesday. I've got lots of news, but won't write it all now. Don't go to that casino. Invest your money in me. It's safer. <laughs> <laughs> Darling mummy, don't slang me about the shortness of this letter. You are a bird. Best luck, much love, Winston S. Churchill. Because he was so bad at Latin and maths, the two main subjects in Harrow at the end of the 19th century, he was put in the bottom form. By being so low in the lowest form, so long in the lowest form, I gained an immense advantage over the cleverer boys. They all went on to learn Latin and Greek and splendid things like that. But I was taught English. We were considered such dunces that we could only learn English. <laughs> Mr. Somerville, a most delightful man to whom my debt is great, was charged with the duty of teaching the stupidest boys that most disregarded thing, namely, to write mere English. He knew how to do it. He taught it as no one else has ever taught it. He had a system of his own. He took a fairly long sentence and broke it up into components by means of black, red, blue and green inks. Subject, verb, object, each had its colour and its bracket. It was a kind of drill. We did it almost daily. And as I remained in the bottom form three times as long as anyone else, I had three times as much of it. I learnt it thoroughly. Thus I got into my bones the essential structure of the ordinary British sentence. And when in after years my schoolfellows who had won prizes and distinctions for writing such beautiful Latin poetry and pithy Greek epigrams had to come down again to common English to earn their living, I did not feel myself at any disadvantage. So naturally I am in favour of boys learning English. I would make them all learn English and then I would let the clever ones learn Latin as an honour and Greek as a treat. But the only thing I would whip them for would be for not knowing English. And I would whip them hard for that. <laughs> and we sometimes forget that Winston Churchill won the Nobel Prize for literature after the Second World War. In his biography, he describes the fact that in exchange for help with the Latin translations, he agreed to help a much older boy with his English essays. On one occasion, the older boy had been set a task of writing an essay on poetry. Winston told the older boy to pick up his pen and write to his dictation as he paced the room. Poetry is the guilt on the gingerbread of life, he began. Mm. And the story continues with the headmaster quizzing the older boy on his essay and being surprised that he was unable to elaborate on any of the things in it. And Mr. Somerville was so impressed by an essay written by Churchill when he was 14 that he preserved it. And in 1947, he presented it to Harrow. Um, it was presented to Harrow by his son. And written in 1889, it describes the imaginary invasion of Russia by a British army 25 years hence. In other words, in 1914. It's nearly 1,500 words long and accompanied by six pages of battle plans giving a graphic account of the imaginary relief of a garrison in Kharkov in the Ukraine. Seeing my opportunity, I jumped on a stray horse and rode for my life. Thud! 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 And the hooves of a Cossack's horse came nearer and nearer behind me. I glanced back, the point of a Cossack's lance, a head of smoke. The Cossack gains on me, a heavy blow on my back, a crash behind. The thrust strikes my pouch. Doesn't penetrate me. The Cossack has fallen over a corpse. I ride back to our lines in safety. Thank Providence. I have escaped with but a wound, and I can sleep tonight under the influence of victory, which is the best narcotic in the world. His knowledge of military history and tactics, his grasp of detail, his vivid description of the confusion of battle, all suggest that his imagination has been stimulated by history lessons about the Crimean War. And in his boarding house, the Grove, the housemaster, E. E. Bowen, was a passionate military historian. And we know that in the summer holidays of 1870, Bowen had actually travelled to the battlefields of the Franco-German War and picked up pieces of shrapnel, which he later used to illustrate lectures attended by Churchill. Imagine, imagine that, imagine a schoolmaster today going to Gaza or Afghanistan to pick up shell cases. Um, and, uh, 
His name appears in the Harrow Punishment book many times. On, on one occasion, he and some friends found a disused factory and started to break the windows with stones. He and another boy were caught by the factory caretaker and reported to the headmaster, who beats them. He always took chances. No really worthwhile achievement would be possible if everyone adhered to safety first all the time and in every relation of life. The British Empire exists today because British men and women were willing to take risks. My brother and I were sent one summer by our parents on a so-called walking tour of Switzerland with a tutor. We climbed mountains, we climbed the Wetterhorn and the Monte Rosa. I longed also to climb the Matterhorn, but this was not only too expensive, but held by my tutor to be too dangerous. All this prudence, however, might easily have been upset by an incident which happened to me on the lake at Lausanne. I record this incident so that it may be a warning to others. I went for a row with another boy a little younger than myself, and when we were more than a mile from the shore, we decided to have a swim, pulled off our clothes, jumped into the water, and swam about in great delight. When we had had enough, the boat was about a hundred yards away. A breeze had begun to stir in the waters. The boat had a small red awning over its stern seats. The awning acted as a sail by catching the breeze. As we swam towards the boat, it drifted further off. After this had happened several times, we had perhaps halved the distance, but meanwhile the breeze was freshening and we both, especially my companion, began to be tired. Up until this point, no idea of danger had crossed my mind. The sun played upon the sparkling blue waters, the wonderful panorama of mountains and valleys, the gay hotels and villas still smiled. But now I saw death, as I believe I've never seen him. He was swimming in the water at our side, whispering from time to time in the rising wind, which continued to carry the boat away from us at about the same speed as we could swim. No help was near. Unaided, we could never reach the shore. I was not only an easy, but a fast swimmer, having represented my house at Harrow, where our team defeated all comers. I now swam for my life. Twice I reached within a yard of the boat, and each time a gust carried it just beyond my reach. But by a supreme effort, I caught hold of its side in the nick of time before a still stronger gust bowed the red awning again. I scrambled in and rowed back for my companion, who, though tired, had not apparently realised the dull yellow glare of mortal peril that had so suddenly played around us. I said nothing to my tutor about this serious experience, but I have never forgotten it. He was very good at art at school, something he took up again when he was 50. When I get to heaven, I intend to spend a considerable portion of the first million years in painting, <laughs> and so get to the bottom of the subject. He didn't like team games, preferring individual sports. There's no record of his ever having played cricket or Harrow football, the two main team sports. He just went off from by himself, a long cycle ride, and wandered country lanes in search of adventure. He had an excellent memory. The school had a competition for reciting 1,200 lines, 1,200 lines of a poem. The boy who made the least mistakes won, and anyone could enter it, but it had always been won by a sort of 17, 18 year old. In his first year at Harrow, Churchill built, beat the entire school to win the prize. He was good at swimming and fencing, where he won the public schools championship. But he still felt a failure. And the reason was that his parents never praised him. They never said, well done. Um, Winston Churchill's non-relationship with his father, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer um, in this country, is illustrated by the fact that after a long dinner with Churchill's own son Randolph in the 1930s, alone at Chartwell, their house, Winston said, we have this evening had a longer period of conversation together than the total with which I ever had with my father in the whole course of his life. And Winston Churchill's mother, Jenny, who was the daughter of a rich American, uh, famously beautiful, but neither a good wife or mother, 
and, and Winston Churchill wrote in his autobiography, my mother made a brilliant impression upon my childhood's eye. She shone for me like the evening star. I loved her dearly, but at a distance. Typical Victorian parents. And this is borne out by Winston Churchill's letters home from Harrow, which are full of hoping for visits which never took place, of wishing for more attention in the future, and being shunted around rather than being automatically welcomed home in the holidays. He was keen on the cadet force at Harrow, which the army still runs in our schools as a way of recruiting potential um, soldiers, and at Harrow it's called the Rifle Corps. And in fact, his father decided that Winston Churchill should join the army. This orientation was entirely due to my collection of soldiers. I had ultimately nearly 1,500. They were all of one size, all British, and organised as, as an infantry division. The day came when my father himself paid a formal visit of inspection. All the troops were arranged in correct formation for attack. He spent 20 minutes studying the scene with a keen eye and captivating smile, and at the end he asked me if I'd like to go into the army. I thought it would be splendid to command an army, so I said yes at once, and immediately I was taken to my work. For years I thought my father, with his experience and flair, had discerned in me the qualities of a military genius. But I was told later that he'd only come to the conclusion that I was not clever enough to go to the bar. However that may be, the toy soldiers turned the current of my life. Henceforth, all my education was directed to passing into Sandhurst, which means going to the army. Everything else I had to pick up for myself. And so in 1890 he took the preliminary exams for the British Army. And uh, luck played a part uh, in this exam, because the night before the exam he'd drawn a lot from the list, uh, from, from the, list the name of one country, to revise for the geography paper. Darling Mama, I can't judge whether or not I passed the exam, but I can tell you I'm very contented with the result. Last night, I thought I would try and see if I could learn the right map. Therefore, I threw all the maps, their names or little scraps of paper, into my hat. And I drew out one with my eyes shut. New Zealand was the one. And New Zealand was the very first question on paper. But unfortunately, he failed the main entrance exam in San <laughs> So he was taken to a crammer. Um, he applied to the cavalry rather than the infantry because it had a lower pass mark. On his first two attempts, he'd done well in history and chemistry, but badly on all the other papers, and he had to choose one of maths, French, and Latin. He was bad at all of these, but he had to choose one. <laughs> and in the end, he chose maths. All my life, from time to time, I have had to get up disagreeable subjects at short notice. But I consider my triumph, moral and technical, was in learning mathematics in six months. At the first of these three ordeals, I got no more than 500 marks out of 2,500 for mathematics. At the second, I got nearly 2,000. I owe this achievement not only to my own back-to-the-wall resolution, for which no credit is too great, but to the very kind interest taken in my case by a much-respected Harrow master, Mr. Mr. C.H.P. Mayo. He convinced me that mathematics was not a hopeless bog of nonsense, and there, were no, and there were meanings and rhythms behind the comical hieroglyphics, and I was not incapable of catching glimpses of some of these. So he passed. And the day he got the results, his uh, father wrote to him, My dear Winston, I was rather surprised at your tone of exultation over your inclusion in the Sandhurst list. The first incredibly, incredibly discreditable feature of your performance was missing the infantry, for in that failure is demonstrated, beyond reputation, your slovenly, happy-go-lucky, hair and scare and style of work, for which you have always been distinguished at your different schools. Never have I received a really good report of your conduct in your work from any master or tutor, always behindhand, never advancing in your class, incessant complaints of the total want of application, and this character, which was constant in your reports, has shown the natural results clearly in your last army examination. 
I shall not write again on these matters, and you need not trouble to write any answer to this part of my letter, because I no longer attach the slightest weight to anything you may say about your own achievements and exploits. Make this position indelibly impressed on your mind, that if your conduct and action at Sandhurst are similar to what it has been in other establishments, which have sought vainly to impart to you some education, then my responsibility for you is over. I shall leave you to depend upon yourself, giving you merely such assistance as may be necessary to permit a respectable life. Because I am certain that if you cannot prevent yourself from leading the idle, useless, unprofitable life you have during your school days, you will become a mere social rascal, one of the hundreds of public school failures, and you will degenerate into a shabby, unhappy, and futile existence. Your loving father. <laughs> <laughs> so Winston Churchill was 15 months at Sandhurst, training to become an army officer, and he did well, though he just scraped in. He in fact passed out eighth out of a batch of 150 army officers. And Churchill's time in the army is marked by three extraordinary events. First of all, that he attempted to educate himself by reading widely. Secondly, that he set out, using his mother's influence, to join as many battles as he possibly could, and where he normally showed great personal bravery or risk-taking. And thirdly, he wrote about these battles in books and newspaper articles in order to earn money which he desperately needed. Right from the word go and throughout uh, his life, we get the impression that Winston Churchill regarded himself as a man of destiny. It was this which drove him to obtain and read books while he was in the army, especially during those periods of leisure while in India, where he arrived in 1896 and stayed for 19 months. He was like many young men I have known who've decided not to go to university. He rather regretted it after the event. But equally, he, he knew that university courses in those days included much of the dreaded Latin. So he wisely settled on a home university course, requesting his mother to send him books. So he set about the eight volumes of Gibbons, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, followed by 12 books by Macaulay, eight of history and five of essays. Um, in February 1897, he wrote uh, in his diary, 50 pages of Macaulay and 25 of Gibbon every day. Both are fascinating and show what a fine language English is. Next, his mother sent Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species, a translation of Plato's Republic, Hallam's The Constitutional History of England. He then um, attacked politics by ordering in 27 volumes of British political facts, the annual register, where he could study every major parliamentary debate and legal development of the late 19th century. He was always short of money. His pay in the army was £150 a year, and, but he spent about £500 a year at that time in order to live up to the style of his regiment. His mother gave him an allowance, um, but this always failed to fill the gap. His mother wrote to him in 1897, I went to Cox's this morning, and found out not only have you anticipated the whole of your quarter's allowance during this month, but £45 besides, and you knew you had nothing in the bank. The manager told me that they'd warned you that they wouldn't let you overdraw. I must say, I think it's too bad of you. Indeed, it's hardly honourable. Knowing as you do that you are dependent on me, and I give you the biggest allowance I possibly can, and more than I can afford. Throughout his life, Churchill followed two rules about money. First of all, that expenditure should be determined by needs rather than resources. <laughs> Secondly, when the gap between expenditure and income became too great, the solution was always to increase income rather than reduce expenditure. <laughs> that was one reason why he was so keen to get into battles, because a newspaper article from the front could earn him 15 to 20 pounds, which is you know, quite a lot of money in those days. So in, 18, uh, in 1897, he heard that there'd been an uprising against the British by Pathan tribesmen in the Swat Valley, close to the border with Afghanistan. And a punitive expedition was planned, and he immediately co uh, contacted the commander, 
who we'd met at a party actually the year before. He got no reply, but undeterred, he set off for what was then a five week journey on his own to the northwest frontier at his own expense. When he arrived, the commander said there were no vacancies, but he could join them as a journalist. And he was with uh, that army for six weeks, and in that time, wrote articles for the papers, and his first book, The Story of the Malakand Field Force, which earned him £600, which is about £30,000 in today's money. The next year he moved on to another war in Sudan, which the army wished to reconquer in revenge for the murder of General Gordon of Khartoum 13 years earlier. The problem was that the commander, Sir Herbert Kitchener, was strongly opposed to his joining, regarding him as, uh, quite rightly actually, his publicity seeking. Um, back in England on leave, Churchill contacted the Prime Minister to support him and eventually he was allowed to go on his own expense on the understanding that if he was killed or wounded then no charge of any kind would fall on British Army funds. So once again off he went on his own and he arrived in time to join the Battle of Omdurman against the Dervish taking, place, taking part in one of the last cavalry charges that the British Army um, ever, uh, ever did. And he claimed that he killed three men for certain, two others possibly. That was in September 1898. And by October, he was back in England writing his account of the battle, The River War. And at that point, he decided to leave the army and set about trying to win a seat in Parliament and earn money by writing and lecturing. But his involvement with war was clearly far from over. His next war was in South Africa as a journalist. The gold rush, as many of you will know, had brought the British into the Transvaal, where the Boers dominated as farmers in isolated communities. And in 1899, war broke out, and Churchill negotiated a deal with the newspaper, the Morning Post, to be paid £250 a month for four months, plus all expenses. And really, you know, that's a lot of money, a lot of money. He travelled to South Africa, and he joined an armoured train heading into Boer territory, which was attacked and derailed, and he found himself confronted by a bow with a rifle. That morning I had taken with me, correspondent status notwithstanding, my pistol. I thought I could kill this man, and after the treatment I received, I earnestly desired to do so. I put my hand to my belt, but my pistol wasn't there. I had taken it off when engaged clearing the line. The Boer continued to look along his sights. I thought there was absolutely no chance of escape. If he fired, he would surely hit me, so I held up my hands and surrendered. He was put in prison, but escaped over the fence 24 days later. His impatience and his belief that he had to seek fame on every day of what he believed would be his short life, because his father had died at a very young age, uh, all combined to drive him on. And he was also incredibly lucky, for after hitching a lift on a goods train, he found himself, still 200 miles from safety, at a colliery, and he knocked on the door, which was answered by an English mine manager, John Howard, who took him in and hit him down a mine. And eventually he was put on, a, put on a freight truck heading for the Portuguese territory of Loreto Marx. And over the next six months he continued to find battles to be involved in all the time telegraphing his news to the morning post. And because of this, by the time he sailed home in 1900 at the age of 25, he was already a famous figure in England, all achieved in that short period. He landed in Southampton in July of, uh, 1900, and ten weeks later, he was elected as the Member of Parliament for Oldham. And he remained an MP, with you know, a little a couple of tiny breaks, for 64 years. 64 years. But MPs then were not paid. So he embarked on a lecture tour talking about South Africa. As a uh, celebrity lecturer, he could command good money. And on the 25th of October 1900, he returned to give a lecture at Harrow. But nostalgia did not prevent him from charging my school a fee of £27, <laughs> which was, you know, to the equivalent today, well over £1,000. Um, in 1904, he made the decision to change parties, and he moved from being a Conservative to a Liberal, because of his dislike of Conservative Party policy towards protectionism and tariffs, combined with a growing social conscience as he became aware of the scale of poverty in Britain. He moved his constituency to Manchester and in 1905 he was appointed as Under Secretary for the Colonies 
in a liberal government. And two years into this government, the permanent undersecretary, the civil servant, you know, who looked after him, wrote of Churchill in his diary, he is most tiresome to deal with. The restless energy, uncontrollable desire for notoriety, and the lack of moral perception make him an anxiety indeed. <laughs> so here's a man who, like at school really, wasn't great at working with a team. Um, in 1908, uh, he married um, Clementine, who was 22, and he was 33. He, wasn't, he was never a ladies' man, Churchill. He didn't dance. He was very bad at dinner party conversation, seemingly only able to talk about himself in <laughs> world affairs. Nevertheless, uh, he got married. And the one thing which comes across, looking at Churchill as a young man, is his incredible confidence, misplaced confidence. <laughs> you might say. Right from his early 20s, if he had what he thought was a good idea, he would write directly to the Prime Minister. Yes. For example, on the 29th of December 1908, he wrote to Prime Minister Asquith, Germany, with a harder climate and far less accumulated wealth, has managed to establish tolerable basic conditions for her people, which we have not. Here are the steps, as I see them. <laughs> One, Labour exchanges and unemployment insurance. Two, national health insurance. Three, state industries, afforestation, roads. Four, railway amalgamation. Five, education compulsory to 16. I believe that there is not one of these things that cannot be carried out and carried out triumphantly. And of course, he was quite right. And, and some of those things he actually did, including the introduction of unemployment insurance, which gave Winston Churchill, later in his life, um, a strong reputation as being a social reformer. Confidence. Confidence is the key. Here's an article I cut out of the paper the other day. The secret to, co to career success is not talent, hard work or education, but sheer unashamed confidence, a study has suggested. Although workers with big egos will often perform poorly and make more mistakes, their colleagues consistently fail to spot their errors and continue to believe they are terrific or beloved. <laughs> their personality means they are often promoted over those who are more competent as colleagues mistake their confidence for talent. <laughs> A study of more than 500 students, academics and workers published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology showed that those who appeared more confident achieved a higher social status than their peers. Within a work environment, higher status individuals tend to be more admired, listened to, and have more sway over group decisions. And so just a tip for all you road scholars. <laughs> in 1910, he was appointed Home Secretary, responsible for law, prisons, and the police. And it's interesting that between the 21st of February and the 6th of May, 1910, Churchill wrote by hand 27 letters to the King, average length 450 words, briefing him on his work, an extraordinary measure of the energy that he possessed and was to demonstrate for the rest of his long life. <coughs> the permanent secretary wrote of him then, once a week or oftener, Mr. Churchill came into my office bringing with him some adventurous or impossible projects. But after half an hour's discussion, something was involved which was still adventurous but not impossible. Despite being a hard worker, Churchill always took long holidays. He fostered his unflagging energy by changes of sea. In 1911, he took a six-week cruise in the Mediterranean. Even in the dark days of 1940, <coughs> the worst year of the Second World War, he insisted on going for weekends to Chequers or Ditchley, a house not far from here. But while he was on holiday, he was still working. Uh, normally writing up his views on matters outside his own department's responsibility. In 1911, he was demoted from the Home Office, but to a job that he most wanted, First Lord of the Admiralty, from which position he was able to devote himself to the task of building up a navy that could match the German navy in the event of war. And once the First World War broke out, Churchill made sure that he was daily responsible for is issuing the most detailed written orders in a way which is familiar to us from the Second World War. 1915 saw the disaster of the Dardanelles. 
the entrance to the Black Sea. The armies were bogged down in mainland Europe, unable to move. One way forward was to force a passage through the Dardanelles, threaten Constantinople, and induce the Turkish government to sue for peace. Churchill and the Allies, however, greatly underestimated the Turkish forces guarding Gallipoli, and the combination of these heavy guns and mines laid in the channel drove the British Navy back. The land battles were an even greater disaster. As Churchill had been opposed by Lord Fisher, who was the professional head of the Navy, as I've explained in the run-up to the Dardanelles, but had been overruled by Churchill, the blame attached, quite rightly, to Churchill himself. And as Winston faced the sack, his wife wrote to the Prime Minister, Winston may, in your eyes, um, and in those who have worked with him, have faults, but he has a supreme quality which I venture to say very few of your present or future cabinet possess the power, the imagination, and the deadliness to fight Germany. Churchill was appointed to the lowest position in the cabinet, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and his wife later on said to the historian Martin Gilbert, I thought he would die of grief. At Harrow, we have a marvellous oil painting of Italy done by Churchill. Um, in the summer of 1915, after the loss of his post in the government, he lived in a house in Surrey for a few weeks. He was depressed and bored. But in that summer, they were visited by Hazel Lavery, a painter who showed him how to use oil paints. And so began a hobby which absorbed him for much of the remaining 50 years of his life. The only occupation, it was said, that he ever pursued in silence. Every time he travelled from then on, he took his painting equipment with him. Change is the master key. A man can wear out a particular part of his mind by continually using it and tiring it, just in the same way as he can wear out the elbows of his coat. There is, however, this difference between the living cells of the brain and inanimate articles. One cannot mend the frayed elbows of a coat by rubbing the sleeves or shoulders, but the tired, tired parts of the mind can be rested and strengthened, not merely by rest, but by using other parts. The cultivation of a hobby and new forms of interest is therefore of first importance to our lives. This is not a business that can be undertaken in a day or swiftly summoned up by the mere command of the will. The growth, the growth of alternative mental interests is a long process. The seeds must be carefully chosen and must be sedulously tended if the vivifying truth fruits are to be at hand when needed. Some experiments one Sunday in the country with a children's paint box led me to procure the next morning a complete outfit for painting in oils. I've never found anything like it to take one's mind for a spell off grave matters. Golf is simply of no use to me for this purpose. I find myself thinking of serious business half the time. But no one can paint or try to paint, which for this purpose is the same thing, and think of anything else. Two or three hours pass in a flash. One forgets that one is standing up or that it's lunchtime. One forgets utterly the worry of the past or the worry of the future. And what fun it is! All those bright colours and the intricate relationships they have with each other. The whole plan of a picture built up stage by stage from the remotest distance to the sharpest foreground. Happy are the painters, for they shall not be lonely. Light and colour, peace and hope, will keep them company to the end, or almost the end of the day. <clears throat> Eventually, in uh, July 1917, he was brought back into the government as Ministry for uh, Munitions. And by 1918, he was in charge of the War Office at the age of only 44. Um, in his capacity at the War Ministry, he was responsible for the Air Force, and he took the opportunity to learn to fly. He crashed twice in two months, on the second occasion suffering injuries, and was forced to abandon his lessons. He opposed votes for women, but in 1919 the first woman MP was elected, Nancy Astor. She and Churchill argued all the time. Nancy said to him, if I were your wife, I'd put poison in your coffee. <laughs> Churchill replied, Nancy, if I were your husband, I'd drink it. 
<laughs> Leaving the House of Commons, he came across another woman MP, the formidable Bessie Bradnock. Winston, she said icily, you are drunk. Churchill replied, Madam, you are ugly, but tomorrow I shall be sober. <laughs> <laughs> In 1924, um, he won the seat as an MP at Epping in Essex and was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, as in all of his jobs, he was explosively energetic. And Neville Chamberlain, a future Prime Minister, wrote of him, I like his humour and vitality, I like his courage, but not for all the joys of paradise would I be a member of his staff. Mercurial, a much abused word, but it's a literal description of his temperament. You never get a moment's rest. I never know at what point he'll break out. His decisions are never founded on exact knowledge, nor on careful, prolonged consideration of the pros and cons. He seeks instinctively for the large, and preferably the novel idea, such as capable of representation by the broadest brush. Whether the idea is practicable or impractical, good or bad, provided he can see himself recommending it plausibly and successfully, to an enthusiastic audience, it commends itself to him. In 1929, the Labour Party won the election, and between 1929 and 1939, ten and a half years, Churchill was out of office. And during that time, he did a lot of his writing, including the multi volume World Crisis about the First World War and My Early Luck, his best, best book. Um, and from this time on, Churchill employed researchers for his books, as well as secretaries. Churchill would write out factual material, he, um, uh, they would then check it, he would then dictate the book, often out of his head, um, but then very carefully correcting it. And all of this work was normally done either in bed or standing at a special sloping desk, which he acquired for that purpose. And Mary Soames told me about the secretarial activity at Chartwell, their house, Sometimes two or three secretaries working there in any one day. Shifts beginning after breakfast and continuing with breaks for Churchill's lunch, afternoon nap and dinner until after midnight. And in this way, he maintained an unbroken pace of dictation for books, speeches and articles. And this mass of considerable correspondence was almost dealt with, sorry, his mass of considerable correspondence was also dealt with mostly by dictation. Um, Randolph Churchill, his son, told uh, Martin Gilbert, I remember how on a very hot train journey in California, he shut himself up in a small compartment and wrote an article. In two or three hours, he wrote an article of about 3,000 words, which he read to us at dinner. He didn't do this so much because he needed the money. He had a sense of guilt, which he felt he must expiate. I remember complimenting him on the article when he read it to us. You know, I hate to go to bed at night, feeling I've done nothing useful in the day. It's the same feeling as if you've gone to bed without brushing your teeth. His political isolation was made much worse in the early 1930s by his opposition to self-rule for India. And um, then in December 1931, he had a terrible car accident in New York where he got, out of a taxi, uh, he got out of a taxi and because he was used to traffic driving on the, on the left, he looked the wrong way and stepped out in front of the car, travelling at about 30 miles an hour. And um, as he explains in the article he wrote about it, anyone else really would have been killed. But there he was. So he had, he had three serious setbacks at this point. He had the Wall Street crash, which removed uh, much of his investments, Loss of office and now a serious physical injury. But he kept going. Uh, another interesting point about Winston Churchill in these years is that despite needing money, he was a keen gambler. <laughs> Martin Gilbert quoted his son. In 1935, when staying at the Chateau de l'Horizon in the south of France, I went one night with my father to a casino in Cannes. By five in the morning, I had won £200, and my father... 500, that's 25,000 pounds by today's money. We left the casino, but couldn't find a taxi. Let's walk along the beach, it's only four or five miles, my father said, and off we went, reaching the chateau at half past six in the morning. My mother, who had never approved of my father's gambling, 
was still asleep. Father went into her bedroom, woke her up, and showered her bed with a hundred franc notes. <laughs> now, of course, history remembers Churchill for his opposition to appeasement, the way he, from 1932 to 1939, criticised successive British governments for failing to stand up to the emerging fascist dictators in Europe and for allowing the rundown of the British armed forces. So here's a, here's a speech he made in the House of Commons in 1932. Do not delude yourselves. Do not let His Majesty's Government believe that all that Germany is asking for is equal status. All these bands of sturdy Teutonic youths marching through the streets and roads of Germany, with the light of desire in their eyes to suffer for their fatherland, are not looking for status. They are looking for weapons. And when they have the weapons, believe me, they will then ask for the return of lost territories and lost colonies. And when that, when that demand is made, it cannot fail to shake and possibly shatter to their foundations every one of the countries I have mentioned. I would now say, tell the truth to the British people. They are a tough people, a robust people. They may be a bit offended at the moment, but if you have told them exactly what is going on, you have ensured yourself against complaints and reproaches which are very unpleasant when they come home on the morrow of some disillusion. Many of Churchill's speeches on this matter were unsuccessful, but as we've seen, the thing about him is that he wasn't discouraged. He pressed on with the same message at a time when the spirit in England was profoundly anti-war and semi-pacifist. He was uh, assisted in his speeches by two sources of official information. Desmond Morton, the head of the Industrial Intelligence Centre, who lived only a mile from his home in Chartwell, had all the secret data on German rearmament, and Ralph Wigram, a young Foreign Office official, who passed on Foreign Office secrets to Churchill, both, of course, acting illegally, but feeding data to Churchill because they so um, agreed with him. Money problems were still acute. In 1938, his contract for writing articles for the Evening Standard were withdrawn because his foreign policy views so different from the owner of the Evening Standard, Lord Beaverbrook. He lost money on the New York Stock Exchange, and he was forced to put his house, Chartwell, up for sale. And he was only saved by a South African financier, Henry Strakosch, who admired Churchill's anti-Nazi views and agreed to take over Char Churchill's American shares at the price he originally paid for them. But during this time, these 10 years, he was essentially working, um, writing for money at Chartwell. Here's a, um, a section from um, a diary of one of his secretaries, Miss Penman, about uh, <coughs> a visit to Churchill's, uh, one of Churchill's favourite places, Monte Carlo. As we passed the casino, he ordered the car to stop, although we had little time to spare before catching the train. He jumped out and ran to the casino entrance, his clothes flapping about him in a strong wind, looking a little shabby and untidy. He disappeared inside briefly and then came out, still running. He waved his right hand triumphantly to me and grinned as he leapt into the car beside me. I have just won enough to pay for our fares home. What do you think of that? <laughs> his Daily Telegraph article was still undictated and it was Tuesday evening. After dinner on the train, Mr. Churchill, who was very tired, went to bed in his berth, and, having called me into the compartment, which was anything but spacious, announced his intention to dictate the articles. He always had these secretaries with him. The only thing I could find to sit on was his hat box, in which he packed his dirty linen. It was barely 12 inches high, and the light was very poor indeed. Somewhere near midnight, the article was finished. On September the 1st, 1939, 12 hours after Hitler's invasion of Poland, Churchill was invited to become First Lord of the Admiralty for the second time. The first months of the war went badly, and in May 1940, with the Germans entering France, the Prime Minister decided to resign. And after a period of negotiation with the other parties, it was decided that Churchill was the only person 
likely to attract adequate support to replace him, especially from the Labour Party. His own party, the Conservatives, would never have appointed Churchill to be Prime Minister. And Churchill was keen to become Prime Minister.